Hazrat Inayat Khan, 1882 to 1927, was a distinguished musician, a prolific writer, and a great advocate of Sufi mysticism. I first learned about Khan from a long quote on abstract sound that was included in Julian P. Johnson's famous book, The Path of the Masters, 1939. It focused on listening to the inner sound as a spiritual practice and underlined how such was efficacious for uplifting one's consciousness to higher regions. The following excerpt is from Khan's 1923 work, The Mysticism of Sound. Abstract sound is called sat i samad by the Sufis all space is filled with it. The vibrations of this sound are too fine to be either audible or visible to the material ears or eyes, since it is even difficult for the eyes to see the form and color of the ethereal vibrations on the external plane. It was the Sati Samad, the sound of the abstract plane, which Muhammad heard in the cave of Ga'ihira when he became lost in his divine ideal. The Quran refers to this sound in the words, be and all became. Moses heard this very sound on Mount Sinai when in communion with God. And the same word was audible to Christ when absorbed in his heavenly father in the wilderness. Shiva heard the same Anahad Nada during his Samadhi in the cave of the Himalayas. The flute of Krishna is symbolic of the same sound. This sound is the source of all revelation to the masters to whom it is revealed from within. It is because of this that they know and teach one and the same truth. The Sufi knows of the past, present and future and about all things in life by being able to know the direction of sound. Every aspect of one's being in which sound manifests has a peculiar effect upon life, for the activity of vibrations has a special effect in every direction. The knower of the mystery of sound knows the mystery of the whole universe. Whoever has followed the strains of this sound has forgotten all earthly distinctions and differences and has reached that goal of truth in which all the blessed ones of God unite. Space is within the body as well as around it. In other words, the body is in the space and the space is in the body. This being the case, the sound of the abstract is always going on within, around, and about man. Man does not hear it as a rule because his consciousness is entirely centered in his material existence. Man becomes so absorbed in his experiences in the external world through the medium of the physical body that space, with all its wonders of light and sound, appears to him blank. This can be easily understood by studying the nature of color. There are many colors that are quite distinct by themselves, yet when mixed with others of still brighter hue, they become altogether eclipsed. Even bright colors embroidered with gold, silver, diamonds or pearls serve merely as a background to the dazzling embroidery. So it is with the abstract sound compared with the sounds of the external world. The limited volume of earthly sounds is so concrete that it dims the effect of the sound of the abstract to the sense of hearing, although in comparison to it, the sounds of the earth are like that of a whistle to a drum. When the abstract sound is audible, all other sounds become indistinct to the mystic. The sound of the abstract is called anahad 
in the Vedas, meaning unlimited sound. The Sufis name it Samad, which suggests the idea of intoxication. The word intoxication is here used to signify upliftment, the freedom of the soul from its earthly bondage. Those who are able to hear the Sati Samad and meditate on it are relieved from all worries, anxieties, sorrows, fears and diseases, and the soul is freed from captivity in the senses and in the physical body. The soul of the listener becomes the all-pervading consciousness, and his spirit becomes the battery which keeps the whole universe in motion. Some train themselves to hear the Sati Samad in the solitude on the seashore, on the river bank, and in the hills and dales. Others attain it while sitting in the caves of the mountains, or when wandering constantly through forests and deserts, keeping themselves in the wilderness apart from the haunts of men. Yogis and ascetics blow Sing, a horn, or Shankar, a shell, which awakens in them this inner tone. Dervishes play Nai, or Algosa, a double flute, for the same purpose. The bells and gongs in the churches and temples are meant to suggest to the thinker the same sacred sound and thus lead him towards the inner life. This sound develops through ten different aspects because of its manifestation through ten different tubes of the body. It sounds like thunder, the roaring of the sea, the jingling of bells, running the water, the buzzing of bees, the twittering of sparrows, the veena, the whistle, or the sound of shanka, until it finally becomes hu, the most sacred of all sounds. This sound, hu, is the beginning and the end of all sounds, be they from man, bird, beast, or thing. A careful study will prove this fact, which can be realized by listening to the sound of the steam engine or of a mill, while the echo of bells or gongs gives a typical illustration of the sound who. The Supreme Being has been called by various names in different languages, but the mystics have known him as who, the natural name, not man-made, the only name of the nameless, which all nature constantly proclaims. The sound, who, is most sacred. The mystics call it ism e asam, the name of the Most High, for it is the origin and end of every sound, as well as the background of each word. The word, who, is the spirit of all sounds and of all words, and is hidden within them all, as the spirit in the body. It does not belong to any language, but no language can help belonging to it. This alone is the true name of God, a name that no people and no religion can claim as their own. This word is not only uttered by human beings, but is repeated by animals and birds. All things and beings proclaim this name of the Lord, for every activity of life expresses distinctly or indistinctly this very sound. This is the word mentioned in the Bible as existing before the light came into being. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The mystery of who is revealed to the Sufi who journeys through the path of initiation. Truth, the knowledge of God, is called by a Sufi, Haq. If we divide the word Haq into two parts, its assonant sounds become Hu, Ek. Hu signifying God or truth, and Ek in Hindustani meaning one and both together expressing one God and one truth. Hakikat in Arabic means the essential truth, Hakim means master, and Hakim means knower, 
all of which words express the essential characteristics of life. Al-Haq is the sacred word that the Vairagis, the adepts of India, use as their sacred chant. In the words Al-Haq are expressed two words, Al meaning he and Haq, truth, both words together expressing God, the source from which all comes. The sound, hu, becomes limited to the word hum, for the letter m closes the lips. This word in Hindustani expresses limitation because ham means I or we, both of which words signify ego. The word hamsa is the sacred word of the yogis which illumines the ego with the light of reality. The word huma in the Persian language stands for a fabulous bird. There is a belief that if the huma bird sits for a moment on the head of anybody, it is a sign that he will become a king. Its true explanation is that when a man's thoughts so evolve that they break all limitation, then he becomes as a king. It is the limitation of language that it can only describe the Most High as something like a king. It is said in the old traditions that Zoroaster was born of a Huma tree. This explains the words in the Bible, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In the word Huma, Hu represents spirit, and the word Ma in Arabic means water. In English, the word human explains two facts which are characteristic of humanity. Hu means God, and man means mind. Which word comes from the Sanskrit mana, mind being the ordinary man? The two words united represent the idea of the God conscious man. In other words, Hu, God is in all things and beings, but it is man by whom he is known. Human, therefore, may be said to mean God-conscious, God-realized, or God-man. The word Hamd means praise, Hamid, praiseworthy, and Muhammad, praiseful. The name of the Prophet of Islam was significant of his attitude to God. Her, in Arabic, means the beauties of the heaven. Its real meaning is the expression of heavenly beauty. Zuhur, in Arabic, means manifestation, especially that of God in nature. Ahura Mazda is the name of God known to the Zoroastrians. This first word, Ahura, suggests who, upon which the whole name is built. All of these examples signify the origin of God in the word who, and the life of God in everything and being. Hai in Arabic means everlasting and Hayat means life, both of which words signify the everlasting nature of God. The word huwal suggests the idea of omnipresence and huva is the origin of the name of Eve, which is symbolic of manifestation. As Adam is symbolic of life, they are named in Sanskrit Purusha and Prakriti. Jehovah was originally Yahuva, Yah suggesting the word O and Hu standing for God, while the A represents manifestation. Hu is the origin of sound, but when the sound first takes shape on the external plane, it becomes A. Therefore, Aleph, or Alpha, is considered to be the first expression of Hu, the original word. The Sanskrit alphabet, as well as that of most other languages, begins with the letter A, as does the name of God in several tongues. The word a therefore expresses in English one or first, and the sign of Aleph expresses the meaning one as well as first.
The letter A is pronounced without the help of the teeth or tongue, and in Sanskrit, A always means without. The A is raised to the surface when the tongue rises and touches the roof of the mouth when pronouncing the letter L, lam, and the sound ends in M, min, the pronunciation of which closes the lips. These three essential letters of the alphabet are brought together as the mystery in the Quran. With A, deepened by Ain, the word Ilm is formed, which means knowledge. Alim comes from the same and means knower. Alam means state or condition, the existence which is known. When Aleph, the first, and Lam, the central letters, are brought together, they make the word Al, which means the in Arabic. The English, all, suggests the meaning of the entire or absolute nature of existence. The word Allah, which in Arabic means God, if divided into three parts, may be interpreted as the one who comes from nothing. El or Elah has the same meaning as Allah. The words found in the Bible, Eloi, Elohim, and Hallelujah, are related to the word Allahu. The words Om, Omen, Amen, and Amin, which are spoken in all houses of prayer, are of the same origin. Ain, the commencement of the word, expresses the beginning, and M in the midst signifies end. N, the final letter, is the re-echo of M, for M naturally ends in a nasal sound, the producing of which sound signifies life. In the word Ahad, which means God, the only being, two meanings are involved by assonance. A in Sanskrit means without, and Hud in Arabic means limitation. It is from the same source that the words Wadat, Wadaniat, Hadi, Hada, and Hidayat all come. Wadat means the consciousness of self alone. Wadaniat is the knowledge of self. Hadi, the guide. Hada, to guide. Hidayat means guidance. The more a Sufi listens to Sati Samad, the sound of the abstract, the more his consciousness becomes free from all the limitations of life. The soul floats above the physical and mental plane without any special effort on man's part, which shows its calm and peaceful state. A dreamy look comes into his eyes and his countenance becomes radiant. He experiences the unearthly joy and rapture of wajd or ecstasy. When ecstasy overwhelms him, he is neither conscious of the physical existence nor of the mental. This is the heavenly wine to which all Sufi poets refer, which is totally unlike the momentary intoxications of this mortal plane. A heavenly bliss then springs in the heart of a Sufi. His mind is purified from sin, his body from all impurities, and a pathway is opened for him towards the world unseen. He begins to receive inspirations, intuitions, impressions, and revelations without the least effort on his part. He is no longer dependent upon a book or a teacher for divine wisdom. The light of his soul, the Holy Spirit, begins to shine upon him. As Sharif says, I, by the light of soul, realize that the beauty of the heavens and the grandeur of the earth are the echo of thy magic flute.